when a nation has been reduced to forming folk dancing troops in order to maintain old customs, it means that the folklore of bygone days is menaced by extinction. When that nation goes to the extent of opening schools to safeguard traditional dances and timeless music, the source of this art form is running dry. The Tibetans who have taken refuge in India know this well. Since the predictable defeat of the Tibetan people's revolt against Chinese administration and facing the particularly anti-religious measures that followed, some 70,000 Tibetans from different provinces took refuge in Indian territory. None were turned away by the Indian government, which helped them with a sense of urgency, ensuring that they had at least enough to live on. The fate of these refugees is tragic. The conditions under which they escaped, the weeks of walking across the mountains, the fear and the hunger have marked these children, possibly forever. Very often, parents have accepted particularly hard jobs, such as building roads at high altitudes. They are obliged to leave their small children with organizations that can take them into care, like this nursery in Dharamsala, where they are looked after and educated under the supervision of the Dalai Lama's sister. But these children are not just refugees like other involuntary immigrants and people in exile almost anywhere in the world who try to smile again despite their parents being dead, their village destroyed and their freedom lost. These children are also the frail heirs to the Tibetan tradition and to the extraordinary Buddhist wisdom which achieved the celebrity of their country, all the more mysterious since almost unknown. The world is roused when the architectural relics of a civilization that died out thousands of years ago are in danger of becoming lost. And all the newspapers talk about the efforts and the enormous sums of money that have been given to protect the Egyptian temples on the Upper Nile. It seems that we are less concerned by the destruction of a culture before our very eyes. Will something survive of the Tibetan tradition and of this extraordinary tantric Buddhism? For neither the worldwide celebrity of the Tibetan Lamas, as regards yoga, occultism and magic powers, nor the commercial success of a few sensational books, enable these refugees with no resources to support the true spiritual masters who are now settled on the Indian slopes of the Himalayas and in Sikkim, and to rekindle the fire which has dimmed on the high plateaus where it had been burning so brightly for so long. <laughs> Uh, 
Up until 1959, the few films and photos which were made mostly in Sikkim or in Darjeeling in India revealed an astonishing world to us. Superficial reports gave the feeling that Tibetans were worshipping a pantheon of divinities with grimacing faces, in whose honour macabre rituals were celebrated that were generally considered as the degeneration of Buddhism. It was difficult for Europeans, for Christian missionaries in particular, to discover the wisdom behind the symbols in these apparently grotesque displays. What is this Lamaism then? since such is the name given by Westerners to the Tibetan religion. Before Buddhism, and then parallel to Buddhism, other types of worship, such as witchcraft and shamanism, have always existed in Tibet. The principal and oldest of these religions is the Bern, Uban Po. It was to the Bern religion's disadvantage that Buddhism became established in Tibet, where it was declared the state religion. Tibetan Buddhism is one thing, Burn is another, and above all, witchcraft, yet another. It is important not to confuse them. Like Buddhist Tibetans, some sorcerers and shamans have also fled their country over the last years to find safety in Bhutan or Sikkim. Near Gangtok, a wealthy Sikkimese called in an occultist healer to take care of his ailing wife. He went into a trance and revealed to the wealthy man that it would be necessary to sacrifice a goat in exchange for his wife's life. The headdress and the instruments used by these sorcerers look like those used by some of the Buddhists who belong to the Red Hat Order. Observers in too much of a hurry have easily been mistaken, and naturally the Tibetan Buddhists don't appreciate this kind of confusion. Sikkim also, this elderly Tibetan woman is an oracle. At times, not always, she too goes into a trance, and while she is thus taken over, she can predict the near future of those who come to consult her. This young girl here finds out from her today what she can expect in the coming months, and receives advice concerning the attitude she should thereby adopt. Furthermore, the official Buddhist church also acknowledges oracles, whether men or women. But their recognition and the demand for their services undergo extremely strict control and regulation. More or less driven out of Tibet itself, witchcraft, and particularly animal sacrifice, have continued to thrive in the border countries, Nepal, Bhutan, and Sikkim. This Nepalese man is called a Jakri. He also lives near Gangtok. I must admit, though, that even some Sikkimese Buddhists do not hesitate before calling him in if a member of their family is ill or endangered. Tibetan Orthodox monks, on the contrary, severely condemn any animal sacrifice. The only sacrifice recognized by the Buddha being the sacrifice of the ego and of the attachment to the world of forms. Personal inner sacrifice, not one of goats or chickens. Ah, 
भाई हाँ पाँच हाँ बन हाँ बासी हाँ बनस हाँ कन्नी हाँ काली हाँ रोमाई हाँ निर्मल हाँ झाँक हाँ हरी हाँ सलपा When Buddha's religion became Tibet's official religion, the Burns and the sorcerers were ordered to respect certain rules concerning their dress in particular and were limited by certain prohibitions. For example, you can observe that they are obliged to beat the side of the drum that faces away from them, as opposed to the rules for official monks. It is said that the sorcerers cover their face with their instrument and hide their shame since their ancestors were defeated by the Buddhists in veritable tournaments of metaphysical discussion and contests in miracles and magic powers. Buddhism was born in India at the foot of the famous Bodhi tree, where 500 years before the birth of Christ, the Buddha Gautama attained awakening, illumination, perfection. Twelve centuries later, Buddhism spread to and eventually took over the vast plateaus of Tibet. Budgaya, the one who, for 2,500 years, people have considered to be the savior, the liberator, the conqueror of suffering, meditated here, struggled through the battle against himself, and triumphed. Here, after having found the path of life beyond all births and all deaths, Gautama the Buddha decided to set the wheel of the doctrine into motion and to give man the teaching of the noble truths which embodies the true vision of what is. And also to teach about the path that leads from darkness to light, from illusion to truth, from death to eternity. His message, everything is ephemeral, ceaselessly changing. Joy never exists without suffering, and nothing, nobody, nor you nor I have an identity that is autonomous or permanent. Here, beneath a tree like this one, the noble prince who had given up the throne, his wife, his beloved son, and who had become a monk to free himself and to free other beings from all pain and suffering. Here, Gautama, the Muni, the ascetic from the Sakya family, on the morning that followed a night that will be blessed forever, became Buddha, the enlightened one, the awakened one, the perfect one. Beyond the Dalai Lama's two masters, beyond these two important dignitaries of the Tibetan Buddhist sect of the Yellow Hats, these prosternations and offerings are addressed to the eternal body of the Buddha. They are symbols of the only true offering, that of oneself.
after 2,500 years of fervent faith, will people still prostrate themselves for much longer before the three Buddhist refuges? The Buddha, the Savior, the teaching, the way of right living, and the Sangha, the communion of sages and the faithful. Not far from Budgaya is Vulture's Peak at Rajgir, the important high place for Mahayana Buddhists. For they say that Buddha lived on this mountain for 15 years and gave the teaching that completes that of the Hinayana or small vehicle. This is the foundation of one of the most well-known and important sacred texts of mankind, the Prajnaparamita, the perfection of wisdom, the beyond, beyond wisdom. Here, the Buddha gave the great secret to the world. Everything, all beings, all incidents, everything that happens, whether marvelous or frightful, is as real as a mirage appearing and disappearing on the infinite, eternal screen of emptiness, shunyata. For centuries in the past, Hinayana, the Buddhism practiced in Ceylon and Burma, and Mahayana, practiced in Tibet, China, and Japan, turned their backs on each other, criticizing and accusing each other of heresy. Nalanda, where the ruins retain so well the memories of the great era when thousands of monks meditated or studied in its temples and in its cells, Nalanda, the famous university, was the high place of Mahayana, and from here its teachings spread throughout the whole of Tibet. Today, in Asia also, the time is ripe for ecumenism. Buddhists from the north and south, from everywhere, come together in the attempt to understand each other in the name of the guide they all share, the Buddha Gautama, the Lord of Compassion. Buddhism was born in India but completely disappeared after the renaissance of ancient Hinduism. But a few kilometers away from the ruins of Nalanda, at the very place where their Buddhist ancestors walked a thousand years ago, some Indians have built a new university where monks from the world over come to study the ancient holy scriptures. If Pali is the language that was used to write down the Hinayana texts, Sanskrit was used by the Mahayanists, and the works of the Tibetan canon were translated centuries ago from Sanskrit into Tibetan, either by Indians invited to Tibet or by Tibetans who went to India. In Tibet itself, the tradition was then maintained and passed on in several ways. Besides manuscripts, the printers used blocks of carved wood, and many Sanskrit texts that disappeared in India during the Muslim invasions have been conserved in the Tibetan version. Works of art were also a means to convey knowledge. An artist, whether sculptor, engraver or painter, could never have conceived of expressing his own profane aspirations, his dreams, his desires, his fantasies or his torments. As in Egypt, at the time of the pharaohs, and in Europe during the Romanesque or Gothic period, anonymous art transmitted laws, truths, a complete teaching, and an extremely strict iconography specifies the attributes and the colors of the tantric deities. These symbols of the great forces that drive the universe and give life to every human being. The Tibetan paintings on fabric, despite or perhaps because of the requirements imposed on their painters, are in most cases of great beauty. However, in Tibet, as in India, or with the Muslim Sufis, the essence of the transmission of spiritual influence is the chain of masters and disciples. Outsiders have the habit of calling all monks and Tibetan ascetics Lama, whereas it should apply only to the true gurus, such as Kangyo Rinpoche, qualified to initiate disciples and then to guide them on the path to liberation. There are many different types of master. Each one has attained complete inner freedom which gives him perfect liberty to undertake any task, even that of building a small temple or a stupa, 
as is the case for Chatral Rinpoche. The type of succession which is particular to Tibetan Buddhism is that of these masters, chosen from childhood and called tulkus. This is why, led by Kalu Rinpoche, these monks are performing before this child, Tai Situ Rinpoche, a ceremony that is common to all forms of Buddhism, the ceremony where they confess to the breach of monastic regulations. They do so, absolutely certain that they prostrate themselves before the continuation of a master who appeared for the first time on earth years or centuries ago. The English word reincarnation is a rather unsuitable translation of the Buddhist notion of a predecessor and a successor. Imagine that at the death of St. Bernard of Clairvaux or St. Francis of Assisi, the Cistercian and Franciscan monks searched for and recognized in another human being the qualities that personified the founders of their orders. Thus, the active wisdom of St. Bernard or the infinite compassion of St. Francis would be perpetuated down to the present day through generations of new incarnations. But not all young monks are tulkus, and many Tibetans who were not recognized as a lama at a very young age join monasteries in their childhood. To be frank, some were there just to swell the ranks during the services. Others studied for years the texts, the holy incantations or mantras, the ritual gestures or mudras, and practiced unceasingly self-discipline and meditation. Tibet was not so isolated from the rest of Asia as has often been described. Even though it was surrounded by notorious deserts that were hostile to the caravans and by mountains that were hard to cross. Tibet was particularly influenced by India and China, but in turn influenced its neighboring countries, Mongolia, Ladakh, Bhutan and Sikkim. Sikkim in particular, although today the country is closed for military reasons, has been a meeting place between Western civilization and Tibetan tradition for the last hundred years. Sikkim, under the direction of its king, welcomed the Tibetan orders called Red Hats or non-reformed, whether Nyingmapa or Kalkyupa. The invocations that millions of voices and prayer wheels have repeated in Tibet for centuries still resound today around the great stupa of Gangtok. Om Mani Peme Hum. The stupas, called Chirtan in Tibetan, are the most representative monuments of Buddhism as a whole. They are built to shelter relics and their architecture composed of five stories, is a book of metaphysics in itself. The five Dhyani Buddhas, or refractions of the Absolute, the five constituents of the human being, 
The five passions that can be transformed. The five perfections. The whole of Buddhism is symbolized here. Even those who are unable to express the elements of wisdom themselves can feel at the deepest level that life has a meaning, that the absolute is compassion itself. They too take refuge in the promise of ultimate perfection for every being and hail the jewel in the lotus. Om Mani Peme Hum. Near the ancient monastery in Ramtek, 15 kilometers from Gangtok, the disciples and followers of the great master Karmapa are constructing a temple on exactly the same lines as the Tibetan temples. I take the opportunity of these images to pay homage to Sonam Topke Kazi, my collaborator and interpreter. It is a work of faith, for hundreds of people have come down from the mountains to work here, voluntarily. Tibetans, Nepalese, Bhutanese and Sikkimese work fraternally together. In India itself, only one temple has been completed by refugees. The one in Missouri, which was decorated by Tibetan artists. But near Kalimpong, the Sherpas and friends of the famous Sherpa Tenzing, the first man to conquer Everest, did not overestimate their strength or their faith, but rather their material resources. Through lack of financial aid, their temple remains unfinished, like the ruins of their shattered expectations and their unshakable hope. In Tibet, some of the big monasteries housed several thousand monks. They were divided into faculties, and generally, a medical faculty was included. Among the few who survived from the monasteries, some were able to retreat into India. In Dharamsala, a group of Lama doctors was formed with the intention of maintaining and teaching traditional Tibetan medicine. I have been told that it takes nine years to qualify as a doctor and twelve to become an excellent doctor. Considering that medical studies demand a thorough learning of thousands of pages by heart, it is not too early to start as a child. This medicine is a synthesis of secular Tibetan practice, Chinese acupuncture and Hindu Ayurvedic medicine. Tibetan chemists say that several hundred types of preparations are made up from a thousand botanical species, giving treatment based essentially on plants. As all the plants were not found in their own country, the Tibetans organized important expeditions to neighboring countries, particularly on the Indian slopes of the Himalayas. The Tibetans have no trouble recognizing the success of modern medical science. But a Swiss doctor was so convinced by the value of some of the knowledge acquired by the Lamas that he immediately learnt the Tibetan language to be able to study with his colleagues from Lhasa. There is, of course, a rift between our pharmaceutical specialities, made up to the nearest milligram, and the approximation of Tibetan chemists. But after a year of observation, this Swiss doctor told me that there is no doubt about the recoveries obtained. The Tibetans have extremely precise ideas about which pills, from the hundreds available, to prescribe not only for a particular illness, but especially for a particular patient. For during my conversations with the doctors in Dharamsala, it appeared to me that they concentrated more on treating a human being as a whole than on treating the symptoms of an organic disorder. Apart from a minute examination of the eye, the diagnosis always takes into account the pulse rate, or more precisely, two pulse rates, and observations of the reactions that occur when a urine sample is whisked, in particular, the speed of the appearance and disappearance of the froth that forms upon it. Here, measurements are being taken with a wooden stick, but the aim is not to locate acupuncture points, 
but to specify precisely the symmetries and asymmetries of the patient's body in relation to the proportions of an ideal type. As in European hospitals, the head consultant and his assistant are accompanied by students during consultations. I was not able to check on this, but extraordinary results have been attributed to a Tibetan type of acupuncture, where measurement is also used. If certain university monasteries were able to accommodate as many as 7,000 monks, one should not forget, since the Buddha himself became convinced that women too could be allowed into the community, they have always found in Buddhism the possibility to enter religious life as nuns, to have their heads shaved and to wear monastic robes. Of the tens of thousands of nuns in Tibet, only about a hundred survivors went into India but they continue to practice yoga and meditation there. The nuns, like the monks, devote their time to the services, rituals, study, reading, prayer and practice of the mudras. These movements involve the entire being, and each one has a deep symbolic meaning. The rest of the nuns settled in Dalhousie, on the opposite side of the Himalayan chain. Before celebrating the office of the Buddhist faith, they make a ritual tour of the bungalow, which is both their home and their temple. nuns belong to the Kagyupa order, the order of the yogis. It was founded by the famous ascetic Mapa and, above all, by Milarepa, famous for his works of initiation and sublime poetry. The encounter with the Tibetan world reveals the division of Tantric Buddhism into several orders. The four main orders group almost all the followers, both monks and hermits. The monks here are Nyingmapa. This name means the elders. Their order was the first to be founded in Tibet. Today, in India, their most venerated guru is this man, who, like many Mongols, is beardless and whose long hair is tied back into a bun in the fashion for Tibetan men. He is a sage who is married. He is father of a family. His holiness, Dujom Rinpoche. It is mainly against the Nyingmapa Lamas that some Westerners have made accusations of immorality, witchcraft, perversion of Buddhism and other criticisms. They disappear of their own accord when one spends some time with men of the caliber of Kensei Rinpoche, Kongyo Rinpoche, and Dujom Rinpoche. Here you can see Dujom Rinpoche celebrating a tantric initiation ritual or Abhisheka. The end of this ritual is too sacred 
too secret to be filmed. But even in the initial part of this ritual, we are taken to the very heart of the authentic Tibetan tradition. I would like to remain silent and spare you the commentaries so that you may, at least as spectators, have the direct experience of this Tibetan tradition. The Sakyapa order, literally the monks from the monastery of Sakya, was historically the second to appear after the Nyingmapa. Their leader today is the Dakti Sakya Lama Trizin Rinpoche. He is quite a young man and he too is beardless and wears his long hair tied back. Despite his youth, Trizin Rinpoche is gifted with some of the parapsychological powers that Westerners have marveled at in certain lamas. These powers are in fact of secondary importance to authentic spiritual life and true wisdom, as the miraculous charisma of certain Christian mystics is to their state of holiness. The Sakyapa is a non-reformed order like the Nyingmapa and the Kagyupa. On the other hand, the yellow hats, the Galutpa, who descended from the reform of Tsongkhapa, constitute the official church of Tibet, the one to which the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama belong. Perhaps one could compare the relationship between the yellow hats and the red hats to the relationship between the Protestants and Catholics as it is today. Though a few important differences and memories of past difficulties still prevail, there is great mutual respect and a sincere desire for closer connection. On the other hand, the distinction between the three non-reformed orders reminds one rather of the main Catholic orders, Benedictines, Franciscans and Dominicans. Their conviction is of belonging to the same church, but each one is attached to its particular tradition and to its founder. The order of the Kagyupas, in which yoga holds an important place, is itself divided into Dukpa Kagyu and Kama Kagyu. The head of the latter is His Holiness Gyalwa Kamapa. He lives in Sikkim and he is also a Turku recognized during his early childhood to be the indisputable successor to the first Kamapa. Even though he is only 40, he is perhaps the most famous of the Tibetan pontiffs after the Dalai Lama.
of all the sages, whether Hindu, Muslim Sufi or Buddhist, he is the most impressive sage with whom I have had the privilege to stay. My own experiences close to him, the radiance of his presence and his silent influence explain the depth of recognition and veneration that are accorded to him. Behind the hieratic mask of self-possession and inner strength, all these Tibetan sages overflow with compassion that is characteristic of Mahayana Buddhists. Their religious life begins with the vow of the Bodhisattva, which is not to dissociate one's own salvation from the liberation of all beings chained to the illusion of birth and death. But the Tibetan church most familiar to foreigners is probably the Yellow Hat, or Gelukpa. Amongst the abbots and the high dignitaries with whom it prides itself, two are particularly respected, the two masters or tutors who educated the Dalai Lama. The younger of the two, Kyabje Trijang Rinpoche, is a Lama of exceptional reputation, distinction and intelligence. The way this monk expresses his devotion when consulting him on an important problem concerning his spiritual life is a sign not of civility, but of the refined etiquette of these humble Tibetans before the princes of the church. Those who have been a disciple have not only received the most enlightening answers to the most vital questions from their master, but also the transmission of a force an energy which cannot be compared to any other known experience. Only they know that the disciple's fervor is neither fear nor obsequiousness, but love and gratitude. They also know that every gesture that is made in the master's presence is a ritual. All food taken with the master is a sacrament. And this silence shared with the master is a communion with the truth of that which is. The elder of the Dalai Lama's instructors, Kyabje Ling Rinpoche, is the living example of these great Galukpa metaphysicians whose perfect mastery of the Prajnaparamita teachings and various tantras slowly prepared them to reach the highest summit of meditation, meditation without form, non-dualistic, beyond all images and representation. Dharamsala, in the north of the Indian state of Punjab, above the valley of Kangra. This is where the Dalai Lama lives, a monk who is 30 years old. Through his title, the Dalai Lama was already famous a long time before he took refuge in India in 1959. Here, he became accessible to admirers, to the curious, to the scholars and the experts. Remote successor of the former Tsongkhapa, recognized as the chief political figure in Tibet by the Mongol emperors, labeled as a living god by journalists the world over, considered to be the reincarnation of the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the 14th Dalai Lama for all the Tibetan refugees is the living symbol of their lost country and their religion which will never be lost. But this sovereign, for whom their devotion extends to collecting the dust upon which his holy feet tread, this head of state in exile, more famous than many of the prime ministers of powerful countries, is not a king, not an emperor, not a dictator, nor the head of a political party, but a Buddhist monk who submits to all the monastic rules of the sutras, including celibacy and chastity, a monk who prostrates himself with his fellow monks from the Patala in Lhasa and confesses the breach of the rules of his order. Although the Dalai Lama is very learned, as were the fifth and the thirteenth Dalai Lamas before him, he is not simply a master transmitting initiatic teachings to a handful of disciples. 
to the Tibetans, he is more than this, much more. He is the precious protector of his people, the Buddha of compassion, incarnated on earth to comfort and to serve mankind. After seven months living with the yogis, the monks and the lamas of different Tibetan orders, I am deeply convinced that the Tibetan Tantric Buddhism, as it appears in 1966 in India and in Sikkim, deserves the celebrity it has gained. However, few books, even those written by the most competent specialists, have been able to show why. Because according to the Tibetan masters, the teachings or the transmission of their tantric and yogic knowledge is only conceivable within the relationship between a master and disciple, with all the restrictions that this entails and the whole background of mysticism that is implied. For the Tibetans, the spiritual quest and the ardent desire for personal transformation are the qualities which give the right to receive the highest knowledge. Whereas, so-called objective scientific research or intellectual curiosity, even the most respectful, do not. The Tibetan refugee monks have a keen sense of dignity. They loathe begging and they loathe selling themselves or their spiritual heritage. Their mantra, symbolic sounds, and mandala, sacred visual symbols, cannot be handed out indiscriminately, and they won't sell their yogic exercises in the marketplace simply to obtain financial support. It seems that the safeguard of this spiritual heritage is the greatest concern of the Dalai Lama, this exiled sovereign, this monk in prayer. In its Tibetan form, the Buddhism of the Great Vehicle, Mahayana, is called Lamaism by outsiders and Tantric Buddhism by the Tibetans themselves. To those who aspire to wisdom, it offers all known forms of ascetic life and all the possible techniques of self-transformation that exist. This Tibetan Buddhism presents itself as a pyramid whose base is monastic life common to all forms of Buddhism, 
whose summit is meditation without form, in which is revealed the unity of all things, the impermanence of every element in the universe, in which only the absolute is eternal. Between this starting point, common to all those who have heard the call, and the perfection that is reserved only for the chosen few, stands the structure of Tantrism that is so disconcerting for outsiders with its pantheon of divinities in terrifying forms, its sexual symbolism, and, in addition, its yogic practices. These monks, confessing to transgressions of the rules, are members of one of the orders called Red Hats, among whom one can find the largest number of both hermits and, on the other hand, married monks. The monks devote themselves to studying metaphysics, sometimes for years. This path can be compared to that of monks anywhere, but the exchange of ideas concerning the noble questions takes on a typically Tibetan form. These animated competitions, these duels, these tournaments, one could say these matches, are the living memory of the heroic epoch in which the Buddhists, trained in Indian Tantrism, had to confront the supporters of Bompu, the ancient Indian cult, and Chinese Buddhism from which Zen emerged, and even Islam or Nestorian Christianity. Those debates, were veritable battles. Sometimes they were competitions for miraculous powers. Today, these controversies between the one and the multiple, the noumenon and the phenomenon, or between time and eternity, are a particularly favored teaching method in the monasteries of the Yellow Hat Reformed Church. Imagine we are in Europe, and that these men are students at a teacher's training college discussing Hegel's dialectic, or even Trappist monks inquiring into the dogmas and mysteries of the faith. Each examiner strives to disconcert his opponent, making him lose his concentration by clapping his hands and shouting. This fairground or battlefield situation gives rise to ample opportunities for diversion. The infant monks also practice in the same way, whether tulkus, incarnate lamas, meaning children who have been recognized as a new manifestation of a master or deceased sage, or simply ordinary monks. If monasteries of a thousand or even several thousand monks were not uncommon in Tibet, today in India, or more precisely, on the Indian slopes of the Himalayas, the exiled monks and lamas have been reduced to setting up makeshift monasteries. For example, Dukpa Tuxi Rinpoche, Guru, that is to say, master of the Red Hat Order called Kagyupa, endeavors to educate and provide for a handful of monks without any material resources, who are destined to continue the long lineage of yogis, disciples of the great ascetic, the study of the scriptures, of the doctrine, of the theoretical knowledge of wisdom, is the preferred approach of the yellow hats, who often practice it for years and years before engaging in more practical techniques of ascetic life. This academic approach to knowledge is not, however, unknown to the Red Hats. The ritual objects being placed before the oldest lamas, 
denotes that the text being read is a tantra, hence the word tantrism. These tantras are esoteric books composed of both metaphysical treatises and manuals concerning ascetic techniques. Only after receiving the initiation of a particular tantra and after hearing it read aloud by his master, is a disciple allowed to begin his personal study of it in solitude. These tantras, symbols of the fundamental forces that go to make up a human being and the universe as a whole, are of different tantric deities visualized by lamas during their meditations. These tantric divinities or deities play a fundamental role in the Tibetan's form of meditation, especially in a highly significant form of meditation ritual, that of the mandala. In the winter fog, four lamas are working together, setting up what is in fact a very simplified mandala of the kingdom where the principal deity of their order resides, E Vajra. The construction of a mandala is already a ritual in itself. These monks are working without notes or models to refer to. They work together in harmony at a shared task that is already a way of broadening one's limited individual consciousness. Nothing is left to chance in the way that the lines and spaces are arranged around the central point which represents the whole, the totality. The building of a mandala, even a simple one like this, takes a minimum of two whole days. Two days for which the monks have prepared themselves by lengthy fasts and prayers. Meanwhile, life in the monastery continues with work, study and daily offerings, activities which, in monasteries the world over, punctuate the hours in the monks' daily life. Once the outlines are completed, the lamas add the colours to the mandala, putting the powders of the five symbolic colours on the appropriate sectors, green, yellow, blue, red and white. Five colours, five directions, north, south, east, west and centre. This division into five can be found everywhere. Five Dhyani Buddhas, each one being an aspect of the Absolute or Supreme Buddha. Five subtle energy centres in the human body. But there is also a sixth point situated above the mandala that is out of space and time and is what Christians call everlasting life. These faithful people are searching for this everlasting life, although they are not fully aware of it. They make the ritual tour of the temple and turn the wheels containing holy scriptures in memory of the wheel of Dharma. The practice of mandala meditation is considered to be a way towards reaching one's Buddha nature, for its geographical and spatial symbolism has, above all, a dynamic quality which leads the person who lives this experience from the periphery towards the centre, from multiplicity towards unity, and at the same time from illusion and death towards reality and life. For the mandala, a visual symbol is a concrete support for meditation. It is, above all, a plan or a map of a deity's domain a place in the centre of which his palace or temple and his throne can be found. Considering that Tibetans are by no means polytheistic, each deity emerging from and returning to emptiness is itself the door towards knowledge of the one reality. Once the mandala is finished, it is set up inside the temple, and there the meditation which is purely an inner ritual of prodigious intensity, will be performed. Each participant will experience the liturgy of the mandala and, through the acuteness of his attention, will take the inner path that leads from the dark exterior world to the light of the kingdom and to that darkness which is even beyond light, that of the uncreated. For the center of the mandala, is the Alpha and the Omega, the chaos from which the world emerged 
and where time comes to its completion. It is the center of the universe and also the center of every man. It is the kingdom of heaven that is within us, within you. Then, once the ritual is over, the mandala is taken apart in the same way that every created thing is continually undone. The powders are taken in procession to a mountain torrent. There they are thrown in the water where they dissolve. In the same way, every element in every created thing is continually being dissolved. Mandalas painted on cloth and then conserved are rare. And one wonders, for how much longer, there will still be monks capable of producing such complex, esoteric works. 2,000 kilometers away, in the Dalai Lama's monastery in Dharamsala, a much more elaborate mandala was set up for the annual ritual Kala Chakra Puja, the ceremony of the Wheel of Time. After the prayers, invocations and purifications, the monks consecrate the place where the ritual will be held and where each person will visualize and experience the inner mandala. In a monastery in Tibet, this mandala would have been set up in the center of the temple and the ritual performed on each of the four sides, facing all four directions. But these refugee monks from the Patala itself in Lhasa have to content themselves with the cramped conditions that compel them to place the mandala against one of the walls and the consecration of the four regions will have to be performed on the same spot. This preparation is at one and the same time a decision to perform the ritual, a prayer to obtain the location, an exorcism forbidding the spirits and evil forces of the psychic or subtle sphere to contaminate this place that is solely reserved for spiritual practice, and lastly, a consecration, a seal set in the chosen place. This ritual is performed with the two instruments that all tantric lamas use, the dorje, the scepter held in the right hand, masculine symbol of activity and power, and the bell, passive feminine symbol of knowledge, of wisdom. To distinguish between wisdom and action, and then to unify the two, is the very foundation of Tibetan Buddhism. I have been told by Tibetan and European experts that these pictures are unique and we are here in that secret heart of hearts of the Tibetan tradition. The true mandala is not one that can be seen with the physical eyes, but one that can only be visualized inwardly. The execution of Tibetan rituals often takes several days, demanding many hours of daily presence in the temple. 
This is why food and tea are distributed amongst the rows of monks. Tibetan tea is made with butter and salt, and a cup gives as much energy as a full meal. As the meditation progresses, it becomes more and more subtle and purified. The ancient science of visualization of a tantric deity, with its symbolic attributes, is very far from our mental structures. However, its theory and practice have been confirmed by the discoveries of modern research in depth psychology. It is a technique of self-knowledge and of the reintegration of the forces that are active in our subconscious. It is, above all, a direct support in the search for liberation, nirvana. Other tantric rituals take on the form of a drama experienced intensely by those who take part. But all these rituals, as disconcerting as they may sometimes appear, aim to lead to the liberation from all attachment, which is the raison d'etre of Buddhism. Whether the rites are simply for the participants themselves, or to liberate an unhappy evil spirit, a soul from purgatory. If it is a ritual intended to separate mercilessly the forces of death from the forces of life, the setting has to be appropriately terrible to suit the real psychic surgery that will take place. There are three actors to this drama. Firstly, the victim, the symbol of this attachment to the ego which blinds us to our eternal reality. Secondly, rising over the remains of the beast in us, the great destructor Mahakala, he who destroys what must, in any case, be destroyed. Mahakala, the terrible, the beloved, he who calls us to awareness. Mahakala, who devours and consumes, who kills to give life beyond birth and beyond death. And, lastly, there is the officiating Tantric Lama, Kensi Rinpoche, considered in India today as one of the greatest sages of the Red Hat Order. Identified with Mahakala, Kensi Rinpoche is about to celebrate a series of rituals, including Yagna, or the sacrifice of burnt offerings, and the ritual murder of three effigies. His weapons are the mantra, sound or invocation, and the mudra, a movement not only of the hands, but of his entire being, the repercussions of which are felt well beyond the physical and bodily plane. Then comes the time when the unhappy spirit is summoned to take its place inside the statue itself.
Pieces of the dismembered corpse are offered as food to Mahakala. <laughs> Kensi Rinpoche then goes to the opposite side of the temple where a straw dwelling which has been built to receive another effigy is ready to be set alight. And Mahakala, changed into a weapon of ultimate terror, is hurled into the blazing house. mortal remains of the spirit are finally given a symbolic burial. His tomb is sealed with the brass plate that had contained the icon of Mahakala. Kensi Rinpoche then celebrates a ritual that is common to both Hindus and Buddhists, yagna, the sacrifice of burnt offerings. For the monks, it is not a matter of attending the sacrifice, but of taking part in it. The fire is the mouth through which the Absolute devours everything that it, itself, cast out of itself. It devours multiplicity and division in order to bring back every created thing to the unity that is beyond space and time. Oh, fire, consume illusion. Untruth, egoism, ignorance, consume suffering, consume death, and give us awakening through the knowledge of that which we really are. In Dukpa Tupse Rinpoche's monastery, the same ritual of Hom is celebrated, this time by yogi monks of the Kagyupa order.
The ritual of Cho, which is celebrated by Tibetan and Bhutanese monks in the monastery of Mindoling, is most moving. It is each one's offering of his own body to all beings in forgiveness for all his misdeeds. The statuette is the image of our own body, created to be a temple, but which our selfishness has made a prison, isolating us inside of ourselves and preventing us from gaining access to the infinite and to the universal. A piece of this sacrificed body is given to the guru, the master, for him to eat. Tibetan lamas are well known for their sacred dances, dances which have gradually disappeared from most of the other religions. But these Tibetan dances could not be compared to the Muslim dervish dances, for example. They are not daily or weekly physical exercises, destined to produce a reorganization of psychological functioning and to gain access to a higher state of consciousness. These dances are always elements of a ritual, conceived as a liturgy rather than as a drama. It is with this in view that the monks discipline themselves under the supervision of their master, just as actors or dancers would rehearse. In the monastery of the great yogi and Tibetan abbot Gyalwa Karmapa at Ramtek in Sikkim, the annual dances last two days. On the first day, that could be considered as an ultimate rehearsal, they are performed without the symbolic masks and costumes characteristic of these lamas' dances. After the four guardians of the gateways of the universal mandala have intervened, Everyone in the audience is able to recognize those who, the following day, will be wearing the costumes and the black, wide-brimmed headdresses of the tantric officiators. Then, those who will be wearing the masks of Mahakala and his followers.
And at the end of the day, the monks consecrate the area with their dance figures by drawing the sign of the Doge, symbol of the active force, united indissolubly to perfect wisdom. The following morning, everything is ready for the most spectacular ritual in the life of the monastery, an icon of Mahakala the Destructor, an effigy in which will reside the spirit to be freed from itself, the audience and His Holiness the Karmapa, abbot of the monastery and head of the Karma Kagyu order. The dignitary officiating consecrates the statue of Mahakala by asking the deity to be truly present in the image that represents him and to perform the ritual himself through the Tantric Lama who will carry out the proceedings. The spirit the soul from purgatory is summoned to take its place in the effigy. Then skeletons come to remind one of the inevitability of death and, through their presence, question everyone as to the real meaning of this death. Four keepers of the four gateways protect the threshold of the sacred mystery of the new birth that follows a consciously accepted death. All these masks are symbols. Far from being gross superstition, on the contrary, they point towards a spiritual science and knowledge of psychology which is highly evolved. With various symbolic instruments, ropes, handcuffs, and different weapons, the officiator gradually prepares the spirit for the moment of death. It is tempting to wonder whether the corrida, bullfighting, is not the vestige of a ritual that was once sacred, when one considers the movements with the cape, the lances, the banderillas, and culminating with the muleta. The moment for the ritual murder has arrived. The celebrant's associates in their ceremonial costumes come into the arena for the death blow. A 
and Mahakala arrive suddenly in the form of a masked dancer accompanied by servants. Mahakala himself will give the coup de grace to the evil entity, followed in this act by all his acolytes. At the end of all these ritual dances, a deer always appears to cut up the corpse and distribute the remains. But no Tibetan would claim that these tantric rituals are the ultimate objective of the Lama's spirituality. In the hermitages in the Himalayan jungles, masters and disciples take up a harsher ascetic life of yoga in what is considered to be a more advanced stage on the path. This elderly man, centered within a tranquil inner strength, is Bhutanese and has spent most of his life in Tibet itself. Those around him are wearing the Bhutanese national costume and have all come to honor a stupa under construction. But this man is not simply a serene old man. He is, above all, a yogi, a very great yogi. Lopon Sonam Zangpo. There are only three young people who, having successfully passed all the severe tests imposed on them, have been chosen to become disciples and allowed to receive their initiation from him. Initiation, in other words, the beginning, admission to the path, and also ordination, the essential transmission of a spiritual influence, of a force the disciple will bring into play by means of all the exercises and techniques of the yogic discipline, bringing to maturity the seed that has been sown inside him. It is certain that the guru, the master, is the one who guides, encourages and teaches. But he is, above all, the one who gives birth to a new life, who brings into the world a world that is not of this world. It is out of time, blessed, limitless, made of stillness that is more active than any movement, made of silence that is more vibrant than any words. At the other end of the Himalayas, Abu Rinpoche is at present the most revered of all the Tibetan yogis who have succeeded in escaping their country to take refuge in India. He has forgotten his age, which is guessed to be about 90, and has arrived at the highest summit to which yoga can lead. He also is a truly qualified master who can lead a disciple all the way to the end of his journey, to the other bank of the ocean of sorrow. But he too, as all other true yogis, restricts his teachings to the initiated only. Tibetan yoga has taken on a form that is quite different from Hindu yoga, whose postures and elementary breathing exercises are popularized today in bookshop window displays everywhere. However, amateurs must be warned that the Tibetan's yoga is far from being put up for sale on the worldwide market of orientalist fashion and spiritual gimmicks. You may only see certain exercises that are amongst the most simple and the first to be taught. And yet, only a few years ago, in Tibet itself, nobody, not even a monk who is not a yogi, would have been allowed to have a glimpse of these movements and postures that were kept in absolute secrecy and anyone trying to watch them in secret would have been severely punished. All physical yoga is based on a paradox. To transcend the mortal body, 
to go beyond the limitations of that body by devoting to that very same body one's attention and efforts. For yoga is one aspect of tantrism. And according to tantrism, nothing, absolutely nothing, must be refused, denied or repressed. Everything must be accepted, integrated and transformed. Like nature changes coal into diamonds. Like the alchemists speak of changing lead into gold. As great as he may be, Abu Rinpoche adopts the most humble of attitudes before the Tulku Lama, Kamtrul Rinpoche, who is recognized from childhood to be the incarnate Lama and presides over the destinies of his order. As secret as the science of yoga is kept, however heroic the yogi's asceticism, as extraordinary and even miraculous as the results may be, these yogis are sages who stay in perfect harmony with what ordinary everyday life entails for every man. These two yogis, one from Ladakh and one from Bhutan, whose vision is beyond the veil of appearances, know above all things that they are one. They are playing their part perfectly, spontaneously, freely. They are completely aware of the present moment and are overflowing with serenity, joy, kindness and compassion. For they are free from any trace of the past, whether conscious or subconscious, and they are also free from the slightest preoccupation with the future. This magnificent doji that is carefully protected in an antique silk drape has been held in Milarepa's own hands, the founder of the order of yogis. This is why it is handled with such respect and brought up to the forehead as a sign of veneration. This doji is the emblem of supreme power, power which, for Tibetan sages, is always related to compassion. Not love that is founded on emotional impulse, capable of becoming its opposite and giving birth to selfishness, jealousy, hatred and despair. No. Love that takes root in the realization of the unity of all beings. Having died completely the death of his own egoism and of the belief in his individuality separate from others, the yogi can say, because I no longer am, I am everybody, I am everything. To those who thirst to know, the master answers. Little by little, he reveals the secrets of the teachings. How to meditate. Where should the eyes be focused during meditation? The Tibetans do not meditate with their eyes closed, but open, sometimes focused on the tip of the nose. The body must be completely relaxed and immobile in a posture that can be maintained without difficulty for several hours. Some tantric meditations are based on visualizations, visions for which no drug, no magic mushrooms are necessary. These meditations last for several hours or even several days. The yogis use a belt to support the body in a position that is sufficiently comfortable. Tibetan yogis distinguish five centers or wheels in the body. The root center, the center at the navel, the center at the heart, the center at the throat, and the center at the head, called the thousand-petaled lotus. The yogis also describe the circulating currents of energy in the body. The two main currents flow alongside the spine, one ending at the left nostril and the other at the right nostril. The energy or prana that animates the whole universe enters the body through the air we breathe and circulates in these subtle energy channels, or nadis. This shows the importance of certain breathing exercises, particularly the watchful and conscious participation in this process of breathing that begins with the baby's first breath and ends with the dying person's last.
This yogi asked me the question, do you know how to recognize a true master? By the way he laughs, he answered himself, and effectively dissolved into laughter. The master, here Dukpa Tuxi Rinpoche, first teaches beginners to loosen the belt at the waist. Relaxing the belly is the foundation of the correct position. How would it be possible to position oneself within oneself if a tight, contracted attitude is maintained? Only the person who has discovered his center of gravity can exchange freely with the universe of which he is a part. The Tibetans locate this center of gravity in the region of the abdomen, reminiscent of the famous Hara of the Japanese Buddhists. All the Tibetan Buddhist ascetic exercises, all the tantric rituals, all yoga practices find their meaning and their accomplishment in meditation. This meditation is forever changing as the disciple progresses and matures spiritually. The visualization of symbolic forms is gradually surpassed and the ascetic rises to the plane of meditation without form, to the perception of emptiness or shunyata, which is the key to Tibetan Buddhism. In India, amongst the refugees, as in Tibet itself around the big monasteries, small cells have been built where a monk can go on retreat and live as a hermit for days, weeks, months, and sometimes even years. During this time, he sees no one and receives his food through a hatch. The monks meditate in these tiny cabins. Today, they have allowed us a glimpse of their world, a world of peace and inner vision. Some are still beginners, while others are advanced initiates. But all of them aspire to the same realization, that of becoming Buddhas themselves, not only for their own emancipation, but for the welfare of all beings.